do you think the departure of Victoria Newland and the way she departed, or was probably forced to put depart, um, indicates that you know the the Ukraine hawks might be out of favor also in the U.S. No, no, the the hawkishness is in the air and in the water in Washington. I meet people that I in uh, I, I recently met someone who is in an organization devoted to diplomacy and uh and establishing ties cultural ties among other things with other countries and uh he was just essentially explaining how uh, everyone in washington you know was wanted to support ukraine and and wanted to give this money etc and uh with with very little thought about the cost of this and whether it could be accomplished. Let's move to the second part of the interview now, where I would like to discuss a little bit more generally with you what the new battlefield situation might mean for the for the for this year. So Russia is apparently advancing on several parts of the front lines at the moment, successfully destroying Ukrainian and mainly NATO uh, military equipment, which has led to the admission, even in the West, that Russia is not as weak as initially uh, portrayed, right? We've seen that last week and the week before that finally it was admitted that, oh, Russia can outperform the entire uh, Western world when it comes to military production, right? They have, Russia has more shells, more tanks, more, more missiles, everything. This has been basically you know, at the, in the beginning, Russia was portrayed as as having to taking to take uh, microchips out of Western washing machines in order to run its its economy, and this this has now changed. Um, so, do you think this will have an impact on Ukraine on the Ukrainian political process? Because you're the you're the one who proposed to me that it was the you know it, there would be a chance that the nationalists would start actually changing their minds and 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 agree to negotiations. Do you think that? You know, the way that the West now starts portraying and seeing things will impact the Ukrainians. No, I, I, I think that the narrative within Ukraine, especially the nationalist narrative, follows its own logic. And those within the government who are willing to deviate or eventually defect from that narrative will be doing so at the risk of retaliation by nationalist forces. The, the entire uh, discussion, a discussion along these lines in Kyiv today, risks fundamentally splitting Ukrainian society, which, by the way, has happened before and is the reason why, you, in all likelihood, Ukrainian independence did not succeed uh, during the uh, Russian Civil War and in the aftermath math of uh, World War I. The two factions that uh, agreed that Ukraine should be united in the Central Rada in Kiev in 1919 and the Western, Europe, uh, Western Ukrainian National Republic in, West, in Lvov, uh, in fact, could not agree and eventually um, stabbed each other in the back and and fought on opposite sides because the Central Rada had uh, Petrura sold out the western part of Ukraine to the Poles in exchange for Polish support against the Red Army in the hopes of thereby obtaining independence at least for central Ukraine. This could I, this is not, it's not far-fetched for me to see something like that happen again. If the na there was a split between the nationalists and the moderates in the Ukrainian government today, both of whom are fighting against Russia for Ukrainian independence, and one, one side were to say, well, we really have no choice at this point except to start negotiations, and the other side simply declares that as betrayal, and... Uh, withdraws and starts to set up its own separatist movement in Western Ukraine. This kind of threat of Western Ukrainian separatism has has run, has been a persistent theme since 1991. Anytime 
there were people willing to negotiate the Ukrainian dream as they saw it uh, in in negotiations with Russia. And and that still that possibility still exists. Are, so I don't see that is happening. So are the moderates and the nationalists, the the the, the hardliners, are they more or less geographically split? Is it so uh, their home bases, their their base of support, yes, is geographically split. And in to a large extent, well, certainly more so than Eastern Ukraine, um, the they have been the Western Western Ukraine has been shielded from the from the impact of the war. Uh, they have been bombed less. They obviously have not uh, suffered. Uh, the total devastation that uh, we have seen at the front lines and in uh, and in Donetsk and Lugansk, parts of Lugansk and Donetsk, and also Western Ukrainians have been a significant component uh, of emigration, and it's easier for them to basically slip across the border into Poland. One of the reasons I think the updating of the mobilization law now that would expand the category of people who could be called up for mandatory service in the armed forces is having such a difficult time is because so far this has not really affected Western Ukrainians as much. And now they would be the ones called up for service. So, you know, uh, that's that's a difficult proposition to sell, particularly when the war is not going well for them, right? For for Ukraine right now. How many how many million people are we speaking about in that part of Western Ukraine, or in that in in Western Ukraine that part? I'm not going to give you an exact number, because we're talking either of the four westernmost regions or a handful of regions that are now considered the center of Ukraine as well, and especially around Kiev. Kiev, in many respects, has a mental attitude, uh, especially in recent years, that has become much more radical, much more, um, much more Western Ukrainian than it has been historically. So, uh, but we're we're talking about given a Ukrainian population that realistically has shrunk to probably thirty million at best, and perhaps less, um, depending on uh, local statistics as from which region we have the most uh, people who have fled. Uh, to the West in in uh, search of uh, security and safety, um, we we have I think a total. I, I did read this statistic: a total possible population that could be mobilized of those remaining inside Ukraine of just over three million, which is very small. And of those. You have to think that when you mobilize that many, whatever people you mobilize, half of that those people are, are not necessarily at the front fighting. Whether it's say for every person at the front fighting, there has to be one person in a support in a support capacity. I mean, the army needs a huge support uh, to uh, conduct uh, military operations. So we're actually talking about perhaps uh, no more, uh, not much more than a million people. And that's in the best of all possible circumstances who could uh, ever be, uh, you know, uh, brought brought into the fighting. Whereas, uh, and I think the, the estimate that they have asked for, what they're looking to, is roughly 30 to 35,000 new conscripts a month, because there has to be a, a rotation. You can't simply have the same people <clears throat> fighting all the time. They get exhausted and, and they have psychological problems. You have to rotate them in and out. 
Um, and this uh, must be contrasted to pretty much the same number of people that are at this point volunteering for service in the Russian military and not even relying on the conscripts that they that they could employ. The disparity between the mobilization potential of people who could be brought into the fight between Russia and Ukraine and the economic potential, and as you mentioned, the potential of actual military production is only growing at the present and is likely to grow for the remainder of this year, given the current production capacities that that we know that have been uh, that are that are well known to um, <clears throat> to analysts. Whether the the only question is, and, and I think this is what people are talking about when in when politicians say we just need to get through this period, and then in the future Ukraine could rebound. It could reconsolidate and launch a counteroffensive. I can only imagine that this would refer to uh, some sort of massive uh, increased investment in uh, military support by the West in Ukraine uh, uh, that would begin to produce um, in, uh, noticeable results in 2025 if uh, Ukraine can hold out that long. And that is that is indeed the big if. I do believe that we are now at the, at, the, at, at the point where it's sinking in also in the West that the military equipment that they sent, that was sent over there has been largely destroyed and is being destroyed. The, the, the military equipment that still can be sent is either a complete escalation like long range ballistic missiles or just the the the, the artillery shells what you actually need in, in the trenches is just not enough well well russia has enough of all of those and the people are running out the ukrainians we are getting to the point where the last ukrainian will have been sacrificed uh, metaphorically speaking um and this leaves only one of two options right either negotiate and come to a negotiated end, which funnily enough, even the Biden administration says they they know that, that the, um, in the end there, there will be a negotiated settlement, but not now. The One of the spokespersons, I, miss, I think Mr. Kirby recently said, said, said something to that extent. Um, either that or, and that's what Macron uh, kind of a, a brain farted out, send the NATO troops because you need people, right? You need, you need more people. Um, do you? Yeah. I think Macron has uh, been forced to step away from that. Uh, his latest version of that, or that of his spokesman, is to suggest that Ukrainian, I'm sorry, French troops might be in a position to rotate out uh, and replace Ukrainian military support functions behind the front lines in order to allow the people in those positions to move to the front and fight. Have more Ukrainians slaughtered, yeah. Yeah, well, that's that's true. But the problem is that is not well thought out because we would still then be talking of tens of thousands, at least, of NATO troops. On in some support capacity somewhere, maybe not with rifles in their hands, but under every norm of international law, valid targets of Russian missiles. How is this going to play out in any NATO country when, if this policy were enacted, the countries, in fact, uh, are are offering this support, but not declaring war on Russia, and suddenly hundreds of French casualties result from a, a Russian missile attack or bombing. You know, one of the reasons that Macron seems to have come up with this idea and, and is that is after the death alleged by Russia, but denied by France, of 
60 French military personnel located in a, in a hotel uh, somewhere that was uh, bombed as a legitimate target, which I uh, believe, uh, I guess, under uh, military law, it is. Um, and Macron just feels that uh, he needed to somehow, you know, defend France's reputation as 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 a as a viable participant in this endeavor. But I don't imagine that the French populace would have much stomach for these kind of losses, especially if France itself does not declare war on Russia, which I see no, no, no likelihood of. Yeah, the, the, the Estonians kind of second and, uh, seconded the, the French, uh, but... The meaningless, the, the numbers there are so meaningless, are, are so little as to be meaningless. It's just interesting that this that this bellicose rhetoric uh, seem, seems seems not to ebb down. But I mean, there is only one of two ways: either you negotiate and, and come to an end, or there needs to be some reinforcement. There's just the time is running out because the Russians are now moving forward, right? Uh, even without even without doing an offensive, <laughs> they're moving forward without an of, an, an official offensive. So this well, is if we don't. Remember that the Ukrainian offensive was underway before it was declared as well. In other words, uh, this is not the days of uh, Prince Yaroslav when <coughs> he would send uh, missives to his enemies and say, I am, I am coming to attack you. <laughs> this, is, this is all done. First, see how it goes. If it's going well, we'll declare this was a well thought of out offensive. And if it isn't going well, we decide, well, we never intended to go that route anyway. <laughs> true, this is true, a much, true. This is a political war, first and foremost. And second, and after being a political war, it is a media war. Yeah. And last yeah. and, and perhaps least of all, at least in public consciousness, is it act, are we aware of actually what is happening militarily? True. And I don't follow this uh, in the same way that professional military people do. But people who have the background increasingly, as I understand it, are coming to the conclusion that we are either at the point or very near the point where no matter what military intervention the, the West might be thinking of, including sending new super sophisticated weapons or adding 60 billion or more to the uh, uh, to the financial uh, uh, purse of Ukraine in its efforts uh, to conduct this war, neither of those will ultimately change the inevitable outcome, which is a loss of territory, either proceeding more more quickly without that support uh, more quickly without that support or more slowly but inevitably with that support and and eventually threatening key of itself and i think that uh question of what to do with kiev and how from, from russia's perspective the question would have to be what to do with kiev and I would think how to use it as a bargaining chip to invade or not to invade, to decimate or not to decimate. Um, and if Zelensky is forced to flee, the government is forced to flee uh, uh, at that time, would all be serious indications of how the how the what sort of end the negotiations would lead to. Right. Um, Alexander Mercury on his channel once remarked, and I, 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 shared, I shared that view, that Ru Russian objectives are not necessarily about territory. It's not the, mo the most territory they want. It is, it is different. It's like, again, neutrality of Ukraine, not being threatened at its border, not, uh, no, no, no NATO stationing there, no forward capabilities. So, and you don't necessarily need to have the territory. On the contrary, if you do have the territory, you might have a bigger problem because like if, if Russia incorporated the entirety of West Ukraine, 
that would probably lead to, you know, 10, 15 years of guerrilla warfare from the other side and terrorism and so on. So that cannot be would, a goal, right? And you would have a NATO more, Poland, more directly on Russia's border, able to supply right. uh, these insurgents. And you would deny yourself the benefit of having the, a rump Ukraine as a buffer state. So in this sense, what is the maximum kind of territory that you could reasonably think that Russia would would agree to actually to 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 hold, which it wouldn't wouldn't see as a as a potential internal threat? I may be way off because I'm just speculating. But I don't think they are far off of the objectives that Putin set by the end of uh 2022, namely the four regions that are currently under Russia's control to their established uh, administrative boundaries, so the entire region that hasn't yet taken place, um, and Crimea, of course. Beyond that, any city that is assaulted a, a city campaign, as I understand it, is very difficult, takes okay. months, and is very risky. So what is worth capturing? Kharkov, the Dnipro, the old Dnipropetrovsk, and, uh, and much further west, Odessa. I've seen, well, John Mearsheimer argues for reasons that he would know best, that Kharkov uh, is likely to fall to a Russian assault. I don't know. The Dnipro looks less likely. Uh, I don't. I. I don't know. The interesting question, strategically, is Odessa worth the fight? Because I see it as more valuable as a bargaining chip with any rump Ukrainian government. In other words, Russia says, we can end this now, and you can have access to the Black Sea and a major port. We'll give that to you, but, you know, in exchange for our terms on the peace agreement. But if you fight, we will continue and take Odessa, and you will be in a much worse position again. I would almost think that a strike on Odessa would be ultimately more strategically valuable to Russia, although they would probably not prefer to expend the resources to, to capture it and leave it to Ukraine in exchange for a peace agreement. But I think it would be strategically more valuable than Kiev. We're, 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 we are fairly back in the 19th century uh, with, with negotiation tactics over land, but it, it is what it is. Let's use the last five minutes just to quickly discuss the the situation inside Ukraine. I mean, we've seen a couple of weeks ago, Mr. Solushny, the general in the G Ukraine general, was like ousted and and replaced. Uh, we are seeing other like uh, political political figures who are rotating or might rotate. Uh, including the, the foreign minister, who's like, there's talk that that he might he might become uh, uh, ambassador to London or something. Um, what the what what's the political situation now? Who's in power and who 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 is who can negotiate? Mr. Zelensky is clearly has a, has a knife at his back from the from the nationalists as well, right? So who has the power to negotiate with? Who would have the power to negotiate with the Russians? Well, like. <laughs> the names that we all know and who speak on behalf of the government, that beyond Zelensky, that's um, Yermak, Chief of Staff, Padalyak, Deputy Chief of Staff, and Budanov, the uh, young, energetic uh, head of uh, counterintelligence. Um, they uh, are often in the press making public statements and as such they are recognized as political opinion leaders so what is what what analysts of ukrainian politics try to understand 
is what are the subtle differences in the way they are describing the situation or what has one said that another has not said. And while that's interesting, it smacks a lot of the old Kremlinology, which uh, expected to understand too much from a situation that is largely hidden from us and that we cannot understand unless we were in the very midst of this situation. We cannot understand, understand the, the true nature of the balance of forces in politics there uh, from, from this distance and from the tea leaves that, that we are looking at. So uh, it, it's really anybody's guess. Uh, could there be a, a, an upstart, a, an unknown figure, no, I don't. I don't think so. Uh, the situation with uh, Zelensky's emergence from nowhere to become a political figure was, of course, supported by a well-orchestrated, well-financed, <clears throat> and prolonged media campaign on the heels of his being uh, the the star in a in a major television series, which was very popular. So there's nothing like that now for and there's no alternative political figure like that there is always the possibility although i think it is remote of some military coup i have no idea uh i think it's rather unlikely that such a, a an, an anti-government military uprising could take place uh, without it being uh, noted uh, by other members of the military establishment and especially by Western military intelligence, which is everywhere in uh, the Ukrainian government and in the Ukrainian military today. Yeah. While, while you might say the su such a, 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 a coup might have its supporters among Ukrainian military, they would of course be reported first and foremost by, by their Western military handlers and advisors and, and it would all, and, and they would, I think, quickly be rooted out, which is why uh, General Zaluzhny is in the United Kingdom today, not in, not in Ukraine. Do you think Solzhenyi was a, a real political threat to to the to, to Mr. Zelensky? It suffices that he was considered to have the possibility of becoming so for him to be removed. And uh, in addition to that, that he had become increasingly vocal in his indirect criticisms of uh, the strategy of the government, although not of Zelensky personally. Now, what he might have offered as an alternative, we'll never know, because his, his, his opposition or his frustration was never that clearly expressed. But uh, it, that in itself sufficed to have him removed. Um, which of course puts him, as I said, as a, at a safe distance from the internecine politics and rancor in Kiev, but it also puts him at a safe distance should he, should there be some sort of change in government and he could then be recalled to support the new government, whatever that may be. So it's the best of all possible worlds for Zeluzhny himself. Very last question. Do you think the departure of Victoria Newland and the way she departed or was probably forced to put depart um, indicates that, you know, the, the Ukraine hawks might be out of favor also in the US? No, no, the, the hawkishness is in the air and in the water in Washington. I meet people that I in uh, I, I recently met someone who is in an organization devoted to diplomacy and uh and establishing ties cultural ties among other things with other countries 
And uh, he was just essentially explaining how uh, everyone in Washington, you know, was wanted to support Ukraine and and wanted to give this money, et cetera. And uh, with with very little thought about the cost of this and whether it could be accomplished and uh, what to do if the mythology of Ukraine uh, turned out to be essentially an invention of Western propaganda and its potential, the, the potential of Ukraine for success uh, in this struggle turned out to be a lie. It, we are very, very far from this, which will make which will make the defeat of Ukraine, should it come to pass in this year or, or soon thereafter, all the more devastating uh, to, uh, to the Washington elite and the West generally. Okay, um, I think we'll leave it at that. Nikolai Petro, uh, professor for uh, politics at the University of Rhode Island. Thank you very much for your insights today. Thank you.